weeks, we have been talking about how important love is in the life of a Christian. Scripture tells us that love is the basic motive and the basic ethic of the Christian faith. Paul said in Romans that love is the fulfillment of the law and that if you could condense all of the commandments into one rule, it would be love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the defining characteristic, the identifying mark of the child of God. Jesus said, it is by this that all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. But this is not an ordinary love. Jesus tells us that this is a love that actually enables you to treat even your enemies with respect and consideration. It is a love that wants and pursues what is best even for those who are out to get you. And it is a love that responds graciously and patiently, even with those who get under your skin. I repeat, it's not an ordinary love. In fact, it's not even human. It is divine. But it is a love that has been made available to everyone who has put his or her faith in Jesus, because when we put our faith in Jesus, his spirit comes to live in us. The Holy Spirit becomes our new operating system. And the default mode of the Spirit's operating system is love. And so when we walk in the Spirit or with the Spirit, when we allow the Spirit to fill us and control us, we are able to love with his love. We are able to love anybody, no matter who they are, what they are like, or what they may have done. Paul is reminding us about this in 1 Corinthians 13. He's writing to a church that was not living up to its potential in this area. Oh, they had some tremendous advantage. They had tremendous gifts and terrific leaders. But when it came to their relationships, they were not operating in the spirit, but in the flesh, which is their old operating system that we inherited from Adam. That system is inherently selfish. And so instead of putting others first, it was me first. Instead of elevating others, they were putting others down. And instead of being kind and gracious, they were being rude and condescending. As we began our study in 1 Corinthians two weeks ago, we learn that we may have spiritual gifts that enable us to say and do extraordinary things. We, we may have faith and knowledge that astound people. We may make the most extreme personal sacrifices. But if these things are not motivated by love, and if they're not exercised in love, they are worthless. It is love that gives value and substance to spiritual gifts and service and sacrifice. We also learn that the word for love, agape, is not an emotional word. It's a volitional word. It's an act of the will. It refers to a deliberate choice and an enduring commitment to pursue the highest good. Of another. The focus of agape is the person, not what the person says or does or doesn't do, but who a person is in God's sight and what the person is becoming. In fact, 
The goal of love is to help that person become everything that God intended him or her to be, which is to be progressively conformed to the image of Christ. And love is the catalyst that enables that transformation to take place. Now, that's the definition of agape, but I told you last week that it's an abstract definition. And abstract definitions um, can sort of leave us wondering what love is really like. Which is why Paul, in verses 4 and 7, talks about what love is by describing what love does. He says in verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Paul divides this this, uh, portion here into three sections. The first is two basic attitudes which constitute a summary statement of love, followed by eight things that love does not do, and then five things that love does. We we focused our attention last week exclusively on verse 4. He starts out, love is patient. Love hangs in there with people who fail, disappoint, or don't improve as rapidly as we would like. Love refuses to give up on people, even if they fail and disappoint and offend and hurt over and over. Love is kind. Or better yet, love shows kindness. This is a reference to being attentive to a person, to their words, to their feelings, to their, um, just the way they, they are. And we want to make them better. It's wanting what's best for another and going after it. It is active goodwill. Love does not envy We get jealous when we compare ourselves with others and what they are or what they have makes us feel inadequate or inferior. But love is not jealous because love doesn't focus on self. Love doesn't focus on a person's status or position or things or money. Love focuses on the other person's soul. Love wants the best for the other. Paul went on to say in verse 4, love does not boast. Boasting is an attempt to make others think that we are better than we are or that we have something better than them. But it is incompatible with love because it's focused on self, not the other. Finally, we looked at the phrase, love is not proud. Pride is all about elevating self. Love is all about elevating others. And that's why pride and love are incompatible. We're going to look at verse 5 this morning, where Paul begins by saying, love is not rude. This particular word has reference to behaving indecently or in a shameful manner. In fact, it's the same word that Paul uses in Romans 1 to describe perverse sexual behavior. There it is translated shameful or indecent. And so it's likely that when Paul used this word, In verse 5, he is describing speech or behavior that has sexual connotations. It might help us to remember that that Corinth was a very sensualized, highly sex-saturated city 
where its citizens had a worldwide reputation for their lewd and immoral behavior. Paul is saying, look, you might live in that city. You might have once been desensitized yourself and engaged in that kind of indecent behavior. But that's not who you are anymore. You have a different operating system now, the Holy Spirit. And the default mode of that operating system is love. Love is not crude or lewd. Love doesn't give someone the creeps. Doesn't, love doesn't make somebody squirm or cause them to blush. Love doesn't act inappropriately. To state it positively, love upholds a person's honor and dignity. Love looks at a person and sees him or her as, as made in the image of God. Because of that, treats him and her with utmost respect. In his letter to Timothy, Paul writes, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Paul is telling this young pastor, to treat people in his church with the respect that he would give to his very closest family members. That's really a statement about love. Treating people with respect, making sure that we are pure in our motives and speech and behavior is a way of elevating those people and upholding their honor and dignity. As you know, inappropriate sexual behavior is making headlines these days. And even though it is disturbing to be made aware of these revelations, I think it's good that these people are being exposed. Because that kind of behavior is thoroughly demeaning to the person toward whom it is directed. It is a violation of their dignity and their worth as persons made in the image of God. Well, Paul goes on in verse 5, love is not self-seeking. Or more appropriately, love does not insist on having its own way. The words in this phrase literally mean to insist upon or to demand something for yourself. The implication is that you are insisting on getting your way or getting ahead, or coming out on top. It's describing a me first, what's in it for me, how to get the upper hand kind of attitude. We see this in politics all the time. Do you remember at the NATO summit last year when President Trump famously shoved one of the other NATO leaders out of the way so that he could position himself in front of all the others and take center stage. Or the famous handshake with the French president in which the firmness and longevity of the grip was an attempt to demonstrate one's superiority. Those may be obvious examples of a me first type of attitude, but it doesn't take much reflection to discover that all of us do this at times. I've noticed it in myself when I fly in a plane. Since I'm a frequent flyer, I usually get to board the plane before most of the other passengers, and I always take advantage of that perk because Besides being able to get situated in your seat without having to be concerned about elbowing the people in front or behind you, or stepping over the seat of the person who's sitting next to your assigned seat, 
I am assured that my carry-on luggage can be stowed in the bin right above my seat, something that is not guaranteed for late boarders. But I've realized that wanting to get on a plane before other passengers is ultimately about self-interest, how I can gain an advantage over those around me, how it will benefit me. Self-interest and self-promotion are the motives behind many of the choices that I make. It happens when I'm trying to find a parking space at Costco. And I feel a sense of victory when, when I find one that's close to the entrance, even though someone else was vying for that same space. Or when I'm piling in a car with a bunch of people and I call out, shotgun! Some of us might hear this and say, come on, Stan, you're overthinking this stuff. These kinds of things are just natural. It's natural to try to be first. It's natural to try to gain an advantage. It's natural to want the biggest or the best. It is indeed natural for the operating system we inherited from Adam. But here's the thing. That's not who we are anymore. When Jesus made us new creatures, he gave us supernatural capabilities because we now have his nature. Therefore, we have his values, his priorities, his perspective. When Jesus was on earth, did he ever try to be first so that he could gain some advantage over others? Did he ever try to position himself in a way where he came out on top? Did he ever choose self-interest over the interests of others? The answers are no. Jesus always put others' needs and interests ahead of his own. Jesus always elevated others. And because we have his spirit living in us, who became our operating system when we put our faith in Jesus, we are able to be just like him in this way. Because love is the default mode of the Spirit. And love is not preoccupied with self. Love doesn't ask, what's in it for me? Or how can I get the upper hand? Paul goes on in verse 5, love is not easily angered. Unfortunately, the NIV does not translate this word very well. The word literally means provoked, and it should be translated, love is not provoked. This word was used in a metaphorical sense of being repeatedly poked with a sharp object by someone. As you know, people have idiosyncrasies and quirks that can get on our nerves. People have edges on their personalities that can get under our skin. People can do things that rub us the wrong way. If we're not careful, if we're not being controlled by the Spirit, we can get irritated or exasperated with such people. We we can forget that these people are made in God's image and that he made their personalities. He designed them. They are precious to him and he loves them just the way they are. We can actually come to resent, even despise such people. In his marvelous book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis describes through his characters a simple yet effective way that a Christian's testimony can be destroyed. 
the senior devil, Screwtape, is writing to his protege, Wormwood, about how to bring down his charge, who has just become a new follower of Jesus. He says, when two human beings have lived together for many years, it usually happens that each has tones of voice and expressions of face which are almost unendurably irritating to the other. Work on that. Bring fully into the consciousness of your patient that particular lift of his mother's eyebrows, which he learned to dislike in the nursery, and let him think how much he dislikes it. Let him assume that she knows how annoying it is and does it to annoy. If you know your job, he will not notice the immense improbability of this assumption. And of course, never let him suspect that he has tones and looks which similarly annoy her. As he cannot see or hear himself, this is easily managed. <laughs> Our reaction to other people's shortcomings and failures and idiosyncrasies often leads to our own downfall because these things can easily get under our skin and stay under our skin. And when they stay under our skin, it's very hard to focus on those persons' God-given dignity and honor. It's hard to move toward them or want what's best for them, or treat them as more important than ourselves. We, we want some space between us and them. But because we have the Spirit of God living in us, we are able to overlook those things and continue to love them because the Spirit gives us His love, agape, which doesn't get easily irritated or exasperated. Listen, it is a thick-skinned love. And it's not easily wounded by the prods and the pokes. And this love is powerful. For it not only survives difficulty and disappointment, it changes them. It's the catalyst for healing and resolution. And that's what Paul talks about in the last part of verse 5. Love keeps no record of wrongs. This is a good translation of this phrase because that word is an accounting term. It was used with reference to registering items in a ledger so that one could keep track of them. Here, it refers to keeping track of offenses that have been committed against you. I want to remind you that people are inevitably going to hurt us. People are sinners. It's in their nature to fail, to disappoint, to offend. That is not the issue. The issue is how we respond to those wrongs. Please understand, love doesn't ignore the wrongs that have been committed against us. Nor does love sweep those offenses under the rugs, pretend that they never happened. That's not love, because there's never any real resolution in those methods. Love almost always deals with, with offenses head on. It doesn't minimize them, nor does it make them bigger than they really are. Love faces the issues squarely in the eye and calls them what they are. Real hurts real problems, real barriers that need to be broken down. But in the process of dealing with them, honestly, openly, gently, there can be resolution. And that resolution is called 
forgiveness. Forgiveness is the opposite of keeping a record of wrong. Let me ask you something. Are you holding a grudge? Are you harboring resentment in your heart? Are you keeping score? I, I want to remind you that there is perhaps nothing more incongruous than a Christian who won't forgive. Here's why. We are what we are by the grace of God. Amen? Solely by the grace of God. And those who won't forgive are either strangers to God's grace or they've forgotten what it's all about and how it has affected them. They've either lost touch with the filth and the ugliness of their own sin, or they've never really seen the offensiveness of that sin before a holy God who was under no obligation to forgive it, but could have justly sent us to everlasting punishment. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich and mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sin. It is by grace that we have been saved. It's absurd to think that I could hold a grudge against someone for a relatively minor debt in comparison with the debt from which God pardoned me. Please, don't take this lightly. If you are holding a grudge or harboring resentment, let it go. Confess it to the Lord and repent. Get out a pick and shovel and start digging a hole because love buries a multitude of sins. You say, man, I just can't. Yes, you can. If God's Spirit lives in you, you can indeed. You see, your forgiveness of others is a supernatural response to God's grace in forgiving you. You can actually be like Jesus, who when he was being brutalized and shamed on a cross, said this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But that kind of forgiveness is only possible when God's Spirit lives in you and you are functioning under His influence and power because we in and of ourselves do not have that kind of ability. We cannot generate or contrive that kind of love. It's divine love. And that means it's not just something you possess, it's something that possesses you because it's Him expressing it through you. Earlier I said that a real test of character is how someone reacts when someone else pushes their buttons or gets under their skin. That is also a test of real love. And we've looked this morning at what real love does, what real love looks like. It is a kind of love and a quality of love that is out of this world, which means we need God to give it to us. So if you want to have this kind of love, Go to God, ask Him to fill you with His Spirit because the fruit of His Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Be filled with the Spirit, brothers and sisters. Keep in step with the Spirit. And when you do, this is what you'll look like. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for the privilege of being born again, having the life of Christ in us when we put our faith in him. Oh, Father, thank you that we have capabilities that are out of this world because of the Spirit of God. Lord, help us. I want to pray especially for my brothers and sisters who are struggling with forgiveness or perhaps struggling with being annoyed or exasperated by their peers or something else that came to light today in this passage. I ask, Lord, that you would give them, by your grace and by the Spirit's power, your victory, the ability to express your love to these other people. Father, do it, please. We're counting on you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask that you stand if you would, please. Let me close our time with a benediction. And now to him who expressed that love in the most profound way possible when he went to a cross and died for our sins in our place. To him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.